Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis. We're going to read through a pretty big chunk of the Noah's Ark story. So grab your donuts and coffee as we get through this. We're not going to read it all, but we'll get through a significant portion. So let's listen to the story. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its width, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and put the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I am going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind, two of every kind shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is eaten and stored up, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and its mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the air also, male and female, to keep their kind alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters came on the earth. And Noah with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of the clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened. The rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah with his sons, Shem, Hem, and Jepheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons entered the ark, they and every wild animal of every kind and all domestic animals of every kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every bird of every kind, they went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters swelled and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. The waters swelled so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters swelled above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, domestic animals, wild animals, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all human beings, everything on dry land, and whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, human beings and animals and creeping things and birds of the air. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. And the water swelled on the earth, for 150 days. During the height of news stories about banned books at school districts across the country, our Board of Adult and Arts and Education here at the church decided to stock our little free library over on Harrison Street with 10 copies of a different banned book every month 
as a way to encourage learning over fear. It was an immensely popular project, and two of the authors even made posts about our church in response. And the most recent book that we stocked it with was one of the most banned books of all time, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. Has anyone read this book before? See a show of hands? Quite a few. It's my favorite Toni Morrison book. It's the first one that she wrote, so she was destined for greatness. And in the 54 years since its publication, it continues to be banned in 20 to 30 new school districts every single year on the grounds that it contains inappropriate material, including sexual abuse and incest and racism. The children's book, I Am Jazz, has also been heavily targeted. Has anyone read this children's book? It follows the real-life stories of Jazz Jennings, a transgender activist and YouTube personality, with one district banning it because it would, quote, recruit or brainwash kids into being LGBTQ+. I don't think that's what books actually do. Three of the most famous books, 1984, Handmaid's Tale, Fahrenheit 451, they are often on the list of most banned books because of graphic content. But these books, you know, are literally about dystopian, tyrannical societies where morals and thought are legislated. And in the last one, Fahrenheit 451, books are actually banned and burned, providing unfortunate students in these school districts with the ultimate real-life example of irony. And much like Toni Morrison's writing, Maya Angelou's memoir, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, has been taken out of thousands of schools for depictions of molestation and teen pregnancy. Has anyone read this book? Yeah, it's amazing. There is another book, though, that is chock full of graphic content. Go back, Jesse. I'm not ready for the reveal. It's full of murder and nudity and genocide, incest and teen pregnancy. And yet, no school district has actually ever banned it. Probably you've heard of it. It is the Holy Bible. <laughs> has anyone ever read parts of this one? Yes, you have. There was an incredible parent in Utah that successfully lobbied his school board to ban the Bible at elementary and middle schools because he was so frustrated that this had as much graphic content as all of the other books they were banning. But it was immediately unanimously reversed when a group of Christians stormed the state house, wielding Bibles like pitchforks, demanding that it be reinstated. And rather than banning the Bible, the state of Oklahoma now requires that teachers stock and use the Bible for instruction in the classroom, despite the fact, again, that the Bible contains even more explicit content than any of the aforementioned banned books. So we are launching a new sermon series starting today entitled Retold, Sunday School Stories You Thought You Knew, where we will revisit some of the most popular tales contained in children Bibles and told in our Sunday School classrooms. But this time around, we are going to examine them in their full context, the good, the bad, and the ugly, beginning with Noah's Ark. Now, Noah's Ark is still a very common nursery theme. You can see in this picture here. You can buy this decor on Target and Amazon and Wayfair and all of the popular major websites. It is so popular with children because of all the cute, plushy animals that Noah and his family dutifully escorted onto the Ark two by two to keep safe and sound. But what the children's version of the story leaves out, of course, we heard it today, emphasized again and again, like six times, is that Noah builds and stocks the ark because of a vindictive, wrathful God that is planning to wipe out humanity and any creature that doesn't get on that boat. Widespread annihilation doesn't really make for a cute print to hang above a crib. The full story of Noah's Ark, though, is one reason why people often ask, why is the God in the Old Testament so angry and destructive compared to the loving and gracious depiction we find in the New Testament? Now, a topic for another sermon is that we can actually discover an equally beneficent 
steadfast, loving God and the pages of the Hebrew Bible. But one way to deal with God's unmitigated anger in the story of Noah's ark is to understand a little bit about genre. The first 11 chapters of Genesis, everything from the creation story through the Tower of Babel up until you get the character Abraham, is known as primeval history. These chapters were never meant to serve as factual history, but were instead intentionally written as fables to help explain larger sociological and philosophical questions. How did humans come to earth? How were mountains formed? How were birds and elephants and whales created? Where does the rain come from? Why does it regularly flood? How does different languages and ethnicities come about? Why does a rainbow sometimes appear in the sky after the rains? The stories contained in the opening chapters of Genesis were created as fables, or an academic word to know, etiologies, E-T-I-O-L-O-G-Y, a story that explains the origins of something. We are all familiar with the existence of fables in Chinese or West African or Greek culture, but for some reason in the church we don't talk a lot about the fact that the Hebrew people had fables as well, the first 11 chapters of Genesis for one. So the portrayal of God in Genesis chapter 11 is not meant to provide a realistic portrait of who God is, i.e. God is one with a penchant for jealous outbursts that wipes away 99% of humanity. But instead, God in Genesis 11 is a fictionalized rendering to explain the ancient belief that bad things happen to bad people. And so you better be careful because the God who sends the rain might just cause it to rain so hard that humanity is wiped out in a flood if we don't behave, and if not rain, then perhaps fire next time. So many other parts of the Bible, and of course our own experience, contradict the idea that bad things only happen to bad people, but that belief is part of this fable from thousands of years ago. And the fact that Genesis chapters 1 through 11 are mythologies, not history, helps to explain why there are actually hundreds of flood narratives from ancient history, not just the one contained in our Old Testaments. And some of them were written much earlier than the story of Noah's Ark. One of the flood stories most analyzed by scholars is known as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Has anyone heard of that before? It, it comes from ancient Mesopotamia. It would have originally been written in Sumerian, but it was discovered later on stelas, which are wooden or stone slabs on which material is inscribed. The Rosetta Stone is a famous stela. So the stellas that were discovered were from the 18th century BC. They had been translated into Akkadian, and the earliest versions of our Hebrew Bible are from the 13th century BC. So here's a picture of one of the stones of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and so scholars have to somehow read what's written on that stone. As pastors, Jen and I would have studied Hebrew and Greek in college and seminary so that we could read the Bible in its original languages. But the really hardcore scholars of the Bible don't stop with Hebrew and Greek. They learn Sumerian and Akkadian and Ethiopic and Aramaic and Ugaritic. I accidentally walked into a class during seminary of students who were studying Coptic, which is the final form of ancient Egyptian, and I swear I had never seen these students before in my life. I think they lived in that classroom studying ancient languages. They may still be in that classroom for all I know, but they're hardcore. The Epic of Gilgamesh, it features a journeying hero like Hercules or Odysseus. This hero is named Gilgamesh. He's part god, part man. And the stories in the Epic of Gilgamesh are fanciful and weird, like when he meets a married couple who turn into scorpion monsters because they're guarding a tunnel that he wants to go through. But in this epic, Gilgamesh also meets a gentleman by the name of Utnapishtim, who tells Gilgamesh that one day the gods decided to send a great flood because one of them, Enlil, wanted to destroy all the humans. However, another god, Enki, instructed Utnapishtim to build a boat 
and gave him the precise dimensions of the boat and that he was to seal it with pitch and that he should bring his family on board along with all the animals of the fields. And after a violent storm, this one only lasts six days and six nights, Utnapishtim's boat lodges on top of a mountain and he releases a dove and a swallow and a raven and when the raven fails to return, he decides that it's safe to open the ark and go out and offer sacrifices to the gods. And in return, the gods make him immortal. As you may have caught on, the parallels between the Epic of Gilgamesh and Noah's Ark are manifold. But there are actually hundreds of these flood myths. Hawaiians have a myth where a man named Nu'u builds a house on a canoe to escape a great flood, and eventually that canoe lands on Mauna Kea, and when Nu'u accidentally offers sacrifices to the moon god, the creator god, Kani, descends on a rainbow and explains to Nu'u his mistake. The existence of all of these flood narratives in history might be a little jarring if we're trying to hold on to the historicity of Noah's Ark, that a man named Noah is the one who gathered all the animals and put them on a giant ark, and after 40 days and 40 nights, he came out of the ark. Because if that's true, then how do we explain the fact that these other myths are written before Noah's Ark? But when we understand that Noah's Ark is part of the Hebrew people's prime evil history, then we actually discover how amazing it is that people from completely different parts of the world and different cultures were somehow connected enough that their mythologies influenced each other on a global scale far before the technological age. Now, who knows, perhaps these stories were written down because there was an actual historical flood event when they wrote, but at the very least, we can marvel at how similar these disparate people groups and their fables are to each other. Now, one other tidbit that I want to point out is that in the Sunday school version, the animals always board the ark in pairs, two by two. And in Genesis 6, 19, that's exactly what Noah is instructed to do. Load up two of every kind of animal into the ark. But did you notice when I was reading that when we transitioned to chapter 7, it changed the numbers so that Noah was told to bring seven pairs of all the clean animals and seven pairs of all the birds. Now let's see if you can puzzle out in your head why it might have changed from one pair to seven. Think about what happens at the end of the Epic of Gilgamesh and the story of Nu'u that I told you, and at the end of Noah's Ark, although a part that we didn't read together, each of the characters offers an animal sacrifice. And if you only have two of each animal and you sacrifice one of them, well, then they're not going to be able to propagate and repopulate the earth. Astute readers of the opening chapters of Genesis will notice that several of the stories, like the creation story and Noah's Ark, seem to have multiple versions that are pieced together. Biblical scholars have long noted that there are surely multiple authors of the book of Genesis, and that later editors would have pieced all these stories together. The authors even used different Hebrew words to name God. One author used Elohim, another Yahweh. And one of these authors wanted to make sure that there were enough animals for Noah to offer the proper sacrifices, and so this author changed the number from one pair to seven. Now, if you enjoy digging deeper into the biblical text like this, then I want to give a plug for my Bible study on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. in the Louise Roberts room. I have this fantasy that during that Bible study, we're going to go through the entire Bible book by book together. And over the course of two plus years, we've studied Mark, Isaiah, Philippians, and Acts, which is 114 of the 1,189 chapters in the Bible. So at the rate we're going, it's going to take a little over 24 years. (laughs) But by golly, we're going to do it! And next week, we're starting on Genesis, which is going to be a lot of fun. So it's the perfect time to jump in. You don't have to come every week. You can pop in whenever you want. Child care is provided. So that's the end of my advertisement for Bible study. All right. Now, even though all of these flood mythologies start with an angry God attempting to annihilate humanity, it's the end of the story that I want to dwell on today. 
In the tale of Noah's Ark, God realizes that no matter how awful people might behave, destroying them is never the answer. The fable ends with a promise of a rainbow that is meant to be a sign that God is more concerned with human flourishing than human destruction. There is always the potential for sun after the rain. The ancient Hebrews created a story where God, and therefore they themselves, come to understand a piece of wisdom that Maya Angelou put like this. Hate. It has caused a lot of problems in this world, but has not solved one yet. That's pretty good wisdom. Maybe we shouldn't ban her books. As we approach another contentious presidential election cycle here in the United States, I have been thinking about this token of wisdom from our Hebrew fable a lot. We are called to be more concerned with human flourishing than human destruction. So much of the political narrative is about what and who we are against. It is so angry and spiteful and hateful so that any discussion about human flourishing gets lost in the chaos and the noise of verbal attacks. But what if we could be focused on a politics of joy, a dialogue about what we are about? I would love for all children to attend school and be able to eat an affordable meal and be safe from violence in the classroom. That sounds joyful, doesn't it? I would love for our earth to thrive because there's less pollution and more food to eat because we have reversed the root causes of global famine. That sounds joyful. I would love for Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Muslims to peacefully coexist in a workable two-state solution with Israeli Jews because we've been brave enough to use our influence to call for peace. That sounds joyful. I would love to increase the availability of affordable housing so that people can afford to have a roof over their house in this state regardless of what job they have. That sounds joyful. I would love to have better parks and better public transportation and more mental health care. It just all sounds so joyful to me. Over the next three months, I want to do everything I can alongside all of you to help humanity flourish. Because in the end, if our government can't do it in three months, then our churches certainly should. Yesterday, all of the leaders of the church's boards and committees here at the church met together for our annual leadership retreat where we set goals about what we want to accomplish for the year ahead. And our theme for the retreat was God's faith in us. It was such a joyful morning of imagining the possibilities. We talk so much about the faith we have in God that we forget that God also has faith in us. The final rainbow sign of Noah's Ark is not just a promise that we can have faith that God wants us to flourish, but it is also a sign that God has faith that we can be part of the flourishing. So church, may we spend our time leading up to the election and beyond dreaming up and living out everything that we can imagine that will help our neighbors on this earth flourish. Doesn't that sound joyful? Amen.